episode 94 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a certified nutritional therapy practitioner and the reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I see clients in person and remotely via Skype, and you can reach me through my website, again, reversediabetescoach.com. Please remember, while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. So, you may recall from the previous episode that I have launched a new series on how to have healthy hormones during perimenopause. And perimenopause is the stage preceding menopause, which again is characterized by a year past your last menstruation or period. And perimenopause is the stage or period before then, and that can last anywhere from a couple of years to several years, so it's very bio-individual. So I've got some really cool speakers lined up for this series, and I actually did have one lined up for today, but uh, logistical issues, I guess, prevented us from conducting the interview via Skype uh, and availability. So I did try, but anyway, the good news is I prepared for it, the interview, so I'm all ready to go here with the topic of estrogen dominance. So you're probably wondering, well, what is estrogen dominance? Well, let me explain it. Uh, This is a common condition that relates to actually declining progesterone, and which is a very important sex hormone and has a sort of synergistic relationship with estrogen. And so most people and sort of conventional wisdom is that your estrogen levels go down. We all, I think, know about that or have heard that. But it can be an oversimplification, can't, sorry, can't get it out tonight, oversimplification, which often leads to, frankly, the wrong kind of treatment. So the way this works in naturally is that you actually have first declining levels, and it's a gradual decline in your levels of progesterone, and while your estrogen levels are normal, and they might even increase. So that progesterone starts to go down, estrogen is level and possibly goes up, And as I said, they have the synergistic relationship, so they're counterbalancing each other throughout the normal menstrual cycle, with one falling while the other rises and so on. So the thing is that while the overall level of progesterone, progesterone declines, that allows estrogen levels to keep rising. And so there isn't that sort of ongoing counterbalance And the result of that is this excess of estrogen, and that therefore is the name of this condition called estrogen dominance, because it's no longer being sort of opposed by or resisted by the progesterone. So interestingly, uh, it's not this diminished estrogen level as almost as much as an excess of estrogen. So, what are some symptoms of decreased progesterone and estrogen dominance? Uh, You probably have already thought of this one, but it's a decreased libido, which is your sex drive. It also can be irregular or otherwise abnormal periods, um, often represented with excessive vaginal bleeding. There are symptoms of that. Bloating, which is an another way of saying water retention, breast swelling and tenderness, mood swings often displayed in irritability and depression, weight gain, particularly around the abdomen and hips, cold feet and hands, and headaches, especially premenstrually. So if a woman begins to experience uncomfortable symptoms at this stage, it's because her body can sense and attempt to adjust to that relative excess of estrogen. Now this excess is also exacerbated by high insulin and stress hormones. So 
we will be discussing the stress hormones and the impact of stress on perimenopause as well as the reverse, how you can deal with stress during menopause, perimenopause during the next episode. So I'm not going to really get into that this episode. But suffice to say that high insulin levels, which is common among people with metabolic syndrome, which is really also referred to as insulin resistance, and that tends to precede type 2 diabetes. So if you already have either one of those conditions, you're more likely to have excess of estrogen. So there's also overlap in the symptoms of different hormone imbalances, and it's not an uncommon for women experiencing signs or symptoms of estrogen or stress hormone excess to be given a prescription for more estrogen, which again is more the conventional approach, or even antidepressants, and that is not really very helpful. In fact, it can make your symptoms worse. So, Another phenomenon can be as the transition goes on, progesterone continues to decline and eventually estrogen levels may begin to swing wildly. The estrogen highs often occur because the ovaries have begun to allow entire groups of follicles to grow and mature during successive menstrual cycles. So instead of only one at a time, they kind of hurry to spend those rema remaining eggs and then the progesterone decline occurs because fewer and fewer of those maturing eggs actually complete the entire ovulation process. So really the physical foundation of a woman's perimenopause and menopause experience actually rests almost entirely, I think, on the health of her endocrine organs, which are pr hormone producing organs. So this is really you know, where you want your endocrine system to be in good shape to manage these hormonal changes and as naturally as possible. So another overlap can be with thyroid problems and while sometimes these problems go undetected because you're asymptomatic, you're not having symptoms, other people do experience symptoms such as mood disturbances, which again are often seen in depression and irritability. So, you know, this is where things really can get a bit confusing to tease out. Low energy level, weight gain, mental confusion, and sleep disturbances. So, again, lots of overlap here. Um, so, thyroid problems, again, are often inter intimately intertwined with menopause. And according to the late Dr. John Lee, a noted clinician and author, there appears to be a cause and effect relationship between hypothyroidism, which is when your thyroid is very sluggish, in which there are inadequate levels of the thyroid hormone, and estrogen dominance. So when estrogen is not properly counterbalanced with progesterone, which I mentioned earlier, it can block the action of the thyroid hormone. So even when the thyroid is producing normal levels of the hormone, the hormone is rendered ineffective and the symptoms of hypothyroidism appear. So even, and this is not uncommon to, we've talked about laboratory, laboratory testing for thyroid hormones, which is why I re recommend you go further than the thyroid stimulating hormone test, which is usually where most doctors stop, or TSH as it's known. And, and get your T3 and T4 tested. T3 is converted into T4. So you want to make sure that you're getting a full panel workup. It's no surprise then that this problem is compounded when a woman is prescribed supplemental estrogen, which leads to an even greater imbalance. So when a prescription for supplemental thyroid hormone fails to correct the underlying problem, so which is estrogen dominance. So it's very important to address the root cause, right? And that is estrogen dominance and not go off on these tangents. So I will include um, a book that I think is very helpful and that I've been referring to, which is by Dr. Christian Northrup, and she has written 
um, this paper book or ebook edition called The Wisdom of Menopause, and she's got some really good information there. So, kind of giving a shout out to her for compiling this. And I wanted to also talk further about, we've talked about the interrelationship between hypothyroid problems. Uh, we've talked about it with insulin as well. And then there's, of course, a relationship with the stress hormones too. And another um, issue is that estrogen dominance has also has a link with inflammation, which isn't really surprising, right? The autoimmune system. So there's overlap or an association with autoimmune disorders, which encompasses quite a range of them, a range of, yeah, them, allergies, which also have an autoimmune basis, breast cancer, uh, which I think hormone replacement, you, that's been a con, uh, with estrogen, has been linked to breast cancer, so we'll, that's a separate discussion. Uterine cancer, infertility, ovarian cysts, and increased blood clotting. And it's been associated with the acceleration of the aging process. So none of those are really good and uh, very important to kind of monitor those for yourself and to investigate things. So what I really want to share with you is these natural ways to treat this condition. So the good news is there are a lot of, you know, lifestyle changes can do a lot to address this uh, phenomena of estrogen dominance. So, of course, nut nutrition, right? Uh, you want to get enough nutrients, which is vitamins and minerals, in your diet. I would, If you have this condition, you might seriously want to consider working with a, a nutritionist, a certified or even possibly a registered dietitian, but somebody who's familiar with this um, or can help you figure out what's going on. So. Uh, you may also want to take a very high quality, properly sourced multivitamin. I have changed uh, some some of the companies I was using because I find that, frankly, the research is also evolving. A good example of this is, you know, calcium from algae is better than calcium from limestone. So where the vitamins and minerals come from, just like food, right, is, is important to the quality and the absorption and so on. So uh, I've switched up my own uh, vitamins and minerals um, and I'm also doing, as I learn, I pass this knowledge on to my clients, so I've also started ordering some different uh, vitamins and minerals. So in the ideal probably for this situation, at minimum you want to a very high potency. Well, you have to be careful. You don't want to overdo it, but because there can be vitamin or mineral toxicity. So, but I would say you want a high quality multivitamin and mineral. Uh, but most of your nutrients, frankly, should be coming from food, especially a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. And these, this will also help balance your hormones. So you want to eat a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables and. One of the reasons is that that will also give you fiber. And estrogen is excreted by the bowel. So if there's any remaining stool, that's going to reabsorb uh, estrogen. So you really want to try and eliminate the excess estrogen. And along the, of course, you want regular bowel movements, right? For that reason and other reasons. So again, fruits and vegetables provide a good source of fiber as well as some gluten-free grains. You also want to make sure you're getting adequate protein, and I usually determine that based on a client's weight and activity level, but for the average person, you want to consume about 50 grams of protein daily. And you know from listening to my podcast, I'm always going to recommend that you that you source your protein properly. For, for meat, it would be grass-fed or pastured, organic meat, wild, and, and that would include chicken and wild-caught fish. So, um, and then if you're, for fruits and veggies, I always just, always recommend you buy organic. That way, you just don't have to worry about getting toxins in your food. And then you want moderate amounts of healthy fat. So, if you recall from my various uh, podcasts and blog posts, that healthy fats encompass omega-3, 6, and 9. 
Most people tend to have too much omega-6 due to consuming a lot of vegetable oils and not enough omega-3 because they're usually not eating enough fatty fish such as salmon and mackerel and tuna and then walnuts are actually a good source of omega-3 but you're going to get most of it through fatty fish and a little bit from walnuts or good walnut oil and then other healthy oils that you can have in various ways. Uh, a good high quality extra virgin olive oil cold press is my favorite. Avocado oil and then there are, of course coconut oil which gives you a little more saturated fat as well as grass fed organic butter. So I use all of these and that does a pretty good job of balancing my omega 3, 6, and 9. And of course you can take fish oil. So if you're not getting fatty fish or you just don't even like fatty fish that much, you know, you're just kind of avoiding it, you may consider a very good fish oil. I ordered a really good salmon uh, oil for a client the other day that is come, you know, of course it's wild caught, but it's, it's really sourced really well off the Pacific and um, this is also organic and sustainable, so it's very good quality. So that's another option. And you may also want to consider transdermal bioidentical progesterone cream. Now, I'm going to get a little more in depth with this with um, a future podcast guest. In fact, she'll be in episode three. And she's Ann Mellon, who's a certified nutritionist and holistic health coach. And the reason we'll be talking about this is because she approaches hormone balancing mainly through herbs, but she does occasionally recommend an over-the-counter bioidentical hormone replacement cream. Now, we, I'll find out if she recommends a, one for progesterone as well as estrogen, but um, she, Dr. Northrup says that many of the symptoms of estrogen dominance, again, excess estrogen, can be relieved by, with natural bioidentical progesterone, which is available over the counter in a 2% cream. So, I mean, when you think about this whole counterbalancing act, it does make sense to use this to progesterone. So, she says a quarter of a teaspoon contains 20 milligrams of progesterone, and she said, recommends using one quarter to one half teaspoon of the cream on your skin, which could be applied to your face, breasts, abdomens, or hands daily for two to three weeks prior to your onset of your period. If periods are regular, you want to use that 2% progesterone daily or from the full moon to the dark of the moon. And then she, she writes here, that way you'll be teaming up with the cycle of the earth itself, the same cycle that governs the tides and the flow of fluids on the planet. That's an interesting concept. So um, I will also share in the show notes um, the link to Dr. Northrup's book and uh, her website. If you're interested, some of she has some of the information from her book chapters on her website, which is helpful. And you want to forget about exercise, right? I can't tell you how important this is when you're going through hormonal changes. Not only will it help you lose excess body fat, but it will help tone your muscles and it will increase and help stimulate those endorphins in your brain which can alter your mood and put you in a better mood because you have a little endorphin high. So I think that's very important especially if you have a sedentary job but also to help kind of put you, help your mood, help regulate your mood. Also you can detoxify your liver. Traditional Chinese medicine says that menopausal symptoms are caused by block liver and kidney chai. Now chai, if you recall from my podcast interview with a licensed acupuncturist Dolma Johansson, we talked about the chi, actually I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing it, and how in acupuncture there are all these streams and, and um, energetic flows and, and that's what they're referring to is that energetic flow within your body or the chi. So your chi, you know, organs have chi, right? Your liver has chi, kidney has chi. So you want to always unblock 
your organs to release that energy or chi. And the liver is a very important organ and as far as filtering uh, the nutrients and filtering what we eat, consume into our bodies. It helps screen out the harmful effects of toxins from our environment environment and the products we put into our bodies. So the liver has to pretty work pretty hard to eliminate toxins such as alcohol, drugs, caffeine, or environmental ones. And the liver's when it does that, its capacity to cleanse the blood of estrogen is compromised. So it's working hard to eliminate this other stuff and may not be as capable uh, um, completely to cleanse the blood of, of estrogen. So detoxing your liver would kind of free up that capacity. And there's other way to de you know, you can do a detox, of course, with diet. Uh, you may want to see an acupuncturist and, and have them, you know, work on, on that area and freeing up the chi. Decreasing stress, that's also very important. You can learn to say no to extra demands on your time. It is important to carve out time to relax and de-stress and I've had uh, talks about meditation and yoga and exercise with experts on my podcast so I may include a flu few links to those in the show notes but uh, Nikki Gratix will be speaking on this topic specifically on the impact of stress on your perimenop on your hormones during perimenopause and also how to deal with the stress of perimenopause because if you can imagine you're going through this and you're experiencing certain symptoms that alone can be stressful so you really this is an important time to be gentle and kind to yourself and to make sure you're setting some time to re-energize yourself spend some time doing things that you find relaxing meditation even five ten minutes a day is amazing can really help you relax. Doing some gentle stretching, going out in nature, just going for a walk. It doesn't have to take long. Sometimes I just literally go for a walk around the block. But just being out in nature, getting outside, moving can all help with your um, stress level and also just things that calm you down. So deep breathing, yoga is good for that, some gentle yoga stretches and so on. So I think we've covered estrogen dominance not you know in super high detail but enough to give you a good uh, explanation and idea of what it is and um, what it's not and so stay tuned for the next episode with Nikki Gradix who's an expert again on the impact of stress on perimenopausal hormones so I hope you're enjoying 